Uh, welcome to Edwards Clinical Education, and we should be looking at the application of the Acumen Hypertension Prediction Index software, and in this simulation, looking at the clinical utility of DPDT. Our patient being simulated today is a 70-year-old male who's having a fem distal bypass uh, with some arm vein graft for peripheral vascular disease. And as most vascular patients has a significant uh, past medical history, he has ischemic heart disease with a reduced ejection fraction due to previous myocardial infarctions, has had previous strokes, hypertension, uh, some mild aortic stenosis and also renal impairment. His medications you can see here on the screen and all are consistent with someone uh, as, such as a vascular path like himself. So again, just as previously to orientate ourselves in terms of the screens we see here in the background, we have our basic patient monitor showing our heart rate our invasive arterial blood pressure taken from a radial arterial line and our oxygen saturations. Whilst in the foreground, we have our advanced hemodynamic monitor, the hemosphere, and currently we are trending hypotension prediction index or HPI at the top, our mean arterial pressure, our stroke volume and our stroke volume variation. Now we just pay some attention to the dials towards the bottom of the hemisphere there. We have our codic output on the far left hand side and then we have our DPDT, a measure of contractility that we'll discuss later on during the simulation. Our EA dyne that is covered in previous modules and our systemic vascular resistance. As we enter the simulation, we are 30 minutes uh, into this operation uh, post-induction. Uh, a quick review of the physiology here shows our heart rate is quite reasonable at 55, we're well saturated, but our HPI is raised at 65, or rather in the higher echelons uh, of the range there. And that's because our mean arterial pressure is 69, and we may perhaps or have a higher likelihood of trending towards hypotension. Our baseline stroke volume is 40, our stroke volume variation is 10, therefore we are not a preload responder currently. And our DPDT at the moment, this measure of contractility that we'll come to in a little while, is 223. Now, uh, just for our information, at the start of the procedure, when the arterial line was inserted awake, uh, DPDT baseline, or the true baseline, was 250. So we can see already as the simulation progresses, our HPI is starting to increase. So gone from a baseline of the 60s up into the 80s there, our mean arterial pressure hasn't changed. But this change or this delta HPI changing from 60 to 80 suggests there is more cardiovascular instability being added into the system. As it gets higher, it implies there's more instability and we are much more likely to be trending towards a hypotensive event. And really this change in HPI, this delta HPI, is our, is our, our stimulus to look around, to have some environmental awareness, what's going on around us, and to also to investigate the underlying physiology to see what the cause of that increase in HPI is. Now once HPI gets above 85, it does alarm, and if we review our physiology at the moment, uh, we see HPI is raised and therefore we are trending towards hypotension. Our map is 67, so we're not hypotensive yet. Remember the definition is greater or less than 65 for more than one minute. Cardiac output, a bit on the low side, uh, but has been stable for this patient. Systemic vascular resistance within relatively normal ranges. Our pulse rate is reasonable. Stroke volume, a, a bit low, but we have a poor ejection fraction and known ischemic heart disease and we are not a preload responder. SVV is just 12 at the moment, and our DPDT, we can see, is starting to drop already. Our baseline value at pre-induction was 250. Uh, the baseline earlier on, the scenario was 220, and so we are seeing a decrease in that. So what is DPDT? It is change in pressure over change in time. It's a measure of the systolic slope from a peripheral arterial waveform. And actually, truly or truthfully, and more accurately, it's the maximum pressure change divided by time from that peripheral arterial waveform. And what we use it for is as a surrogate for left ventricular contractility. 
Now, if we think about what true left ventricular contractility is, well, to do that, we have to draw pressure volume curves. If we draw pressure volume curves at varying preloads and we join the end systolic points together, what we have is the end systolic pressure volume relationship. And that is a true measure of our left ventricular contractility. The gradient of that line is called end systolic elastance, and that's what we use to quantify physiologically or to truly define what our LV contractility is. Now, to think that something measured at a peripheral arterial waveform uh, represents what's going on at the ventricle it is quite, um, quite a large assumption to make. We have to assume that our left ventricular end systolic elastance is equal to our left ventricular pressure time change, which is equal to this left or this pressure time change in a peripheral artery. Now, of course, these things are not the same. But what they do, or rather what DPDT does, is it tracks the changes in contractility or true measures of left ventricular contractility. So if our true ventricular contractility goes down, then our DPDT will go down. If our true LV contractility goes up, then our DPDT measured at this peripheral artery will also go up as well. So DPDT is a measure of our LV function, but we use it as a trending parameter rather than an absolute value. So we need to bear that in mind as this simulation starts to or continues to progress. So going back to the simulation now, we see our HPI has been raised now for a little while. It's now at 94. Our map is now 66, so almost at the cusp of our hypotensive threshold. And our SVV is, oh, sorry, our stroke volume is now starting to drop, has decreased from 41 now down to 36. SVV is 12, so at the cusp of being a preload responder. And our cardiac output is relatively unchanged, but DPDT is now 185. Now, bearing in mind our baseline value was around about 250 prior to induction, that represents around about a 20% drop in contractility. Now, we've just uh, gone to being officially hypertensive now, so MAP less than 65. And just interesting to note that our uh, HPI gave us a warning of almost four to five minutes of this event occurring. So the question now is what do we do about this hypotension? We have to look at our underlying physiology and decide what to do. Now in this scenario, what has been decided is to give a fluid bolus, so a bolus of crystalloid. Now, actually, if we go back and we review our physiology, we can tell a priori that this will not improve our blood pressure. And why is that? Well, we have to go back and look at EA Dine, and a proper description of EA Dine is available in some of the other, or one of the other modules. But EA Dine tells us if a patient who is preload responsive will increase their blood pressure to a fluid bolus. Now, for that to be valid, there are three things that have to be true. First of all, you have to be hypotensive, which this patient is. Secondly, you have to be a preload responder, which this patient now is. The SVV is 13. But EA Dine needs to be raised. And EA Dine is not raised in this case, and we define raised as being greater than one. So you know a priori, that giving this individual fluid will improve their stroke volume because they were preload responsive, but it will not improve the blood pressure. So if we are giving fluid to this patient to improve their mean arterial pressure, that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. And we can see now, despite giving that fluid bolus, the blood pressure continues to drop and the HPI remains high at 100 or its maximum value. When we actually go back and look at the physiology now, we can see that SVV is on the cusp of being a preload responder, but so it may or may not be. But by giving that preload balls before, we've shown that it hasn't increased the straight volume very much. But when we look at our bottom parameters, our variables, we can see that DPDT is 186. So we've had a 20% plus drop from our baseline. And on the opposite side of that, our SVR is 1236, so within our normal parameters. So what we're seeing here is a decrease in contractility. So giving a fluid bolus will not improve that blood pressure. What this patient needs is some iontropic stimulation. 
And when we talk about ionotropic stimulation or giving the ionotrope, we are not talking about starting um, the peripheral ionotropes such as adrenaline, etc. We're talking about giving a small bolus of something such as ephedrine that will give us some beat stimulation and improve our contractility. So just to review the physiology once again, HPI is raised because our mean arterial pressure is way below 65 now. Our straight volume has seen a drop from our baseline of 41, but we're not really fluid responsive. SVV is just on the threshold of where you'll be definitely fluid responsive or pretty responsive, and we've challenged that with a fluid bolus and nothing's happened. However, we knew that challenging it because the low EA dyne would not increase blood pressure. So the underlying cause of the instability and the hypertension is a decrease in inotropy, and that is reflected in the decrease in DPDT. So now where we see the green arrow, we've given a small bolus of ephedrine to provide some beta stimulation uh, to the heart. And what we should see is a start to increase in our contractility and an increase in our blood pressure, and that will be mirrored by a decrease in our HPI hypertension prediction index. So the FM bolus is now uh, just going in, and we should start to see some effect in the next 30 seconds or so. And there it goes. Our straight volume has now started to increase, gone from 37 up to 43. Our DPDT has also started to increase, now at 212. So giving that uh, bolus of FGN, that beta stimulation, that positive ionotropy has improved contractility, which has improved stroke volume, I mean arterial pressure, and that increase in contractility is reflected by an increase in DPDT. As it has further effect, our mean arterial pressure starts to increase now, it's now at 66, our straight volume continues to increase, and eventually we'll start to see our HPI start to come down. So by using HPI, we can predict hypertension before it occurs. Remember, in this scenario, we had at least four minutes warning. And by using our secondary parameters, uh, such as SVV, as DPDT, and SVR and EA dyne, we can investigate the underlying physiology that is causing hypertension. We can decide what is the incorrect treatment and also decide what is the correct treatment in order to rectify uh, the underlying physiological state. And now as we come to the end of stimulation, uh, we can see Eftrin has its maximum effect. Uh, we've increased our blood pressure outside of the range where harm is associated. Our straight volume is dramatically improved and higher than our baseline values. And HPI has come down to a, a lower level implying increased cardiovascular stability. Our DPDT now is back to 256, and that was the baseline. That's our pre-induction value when we placed the arterial line before anesthesia commenced. So I hope you've seen the value of HPI and in this particular scenario the value of the additional parameter DPDT. So really just to round up, um, contractility is often affected by anesthesia and therefore uh, or rather uh, measuring DPT uh, is an important parameter. Um, inappropriate vasocompressors can worsen straight volume and cardiac index whilst improving MAP. And unless we look at our advanced monitor, particularly straight volume and contractility, this is very hard to elicit at times. And sometimes ionotropes are required because the decrease in ionotropy is the underlying physiological condition that is leading towards hypertension. The hypertension prediction index software and the secondary screen help guide the appropriate therapy in this case. Um, however, the index itself should not be used to make clinical decisions. It is the underlying physiology that we treat.